So today we are going to have a new section on the flash. And this is a long tail memory. It's different from the S and D run. So this one you can store the data even after the turn of the power supply. So this is the outline for the flash memory. First we will have an overview of the technology. And then we will go deep into the device physics of the flash technology. And then we'll talk about two array architectures for flash. One is no, one is land. And then we will talk about the multi-level cell in more details. And then the reliability issues with the land. And then of course the scaling challenges for the land. And then the recent trends like the chart trap cell and the 3D land. First of all, you know the flash is used every day in your electronics. And actually this is really the technology driver for the digital age. And uh, uh, I think this is uh, how the Apple becomes, you know, the popular in terms of those, like uh, from the old days, like iPod to nowadays this iPhone business. So all those mobile computing actually rely on this technology because you need to store the data in compact form. And uh, here we saw those, those examples. Right? So you have different capacities, like uh, 512 gigabytes for your SSD, typically in your laptop. And you know, the USB in all this can be like 128 gigabytes or even more. And of course, the uh, Smartphones, you have those storage. So let's look at the history of the storage. So here we call this memory technology as a digital storage medium. So the storage a little bit from different from the memory uh, because storage means that you save the data for a long time, and the memory. You know, it's for the like, memory, like, like DRAM. So those data are frequently accessed. But the storage means that you need to save the data for a long time. So actually, we have different kinds of uh, mechanisms to store the data. And uh, the first one is magnetic based. So this is like. Um, back in the 1920s. So we have those magnetic tapes invented at that time. So magnetic tapes, from magnetic tapes to, let's say, the floppy disk. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen that. Big one. Small yeah. one. No, but the, the bigger one, they were two. There was a big yeah, one. different sizes. Yeah, typically like 2.5 inch floppy yeah. disk. So, yeah, maybe you guys are too young to see those. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I, I used that a long time ago. But uh, uh, then we have the hard disk drive, and uh, that is still used today uh, because the capacity is still larger. And uh, then this is uh, for the mag magnetic-based uh, storage. And then we have uh, optical based uh, storage. So, like CD, and uh, you know the variants of the CD, you have the uh, DVD or Blu ray these days. So, this is uh, use the optical way to store the data. Actually, still the data is stored on the, let's say, solid state material. But when you read all the data, you share the light to the CD and then depend on the reflectance of that light, then you can determine zero and one. So this is the optical way to read out. But those are not very popular these days, right? So what is more popular is this semiconductor based storage. And uh, uh, this actually start from 1950s uh, from the ROM. Uh, read-only memory. Still, we have that today for this so-called one o, uh, OTP, one-time 
programmable memory. So if you just need some key, for example, and you just need to program it once, then you still use that this, uh, ROM. Typically, it's uh, based on this fuse or anti-fuse kind of uh, structure. So basically, you have some, let's say, contact wire, and then you can basically burn down that wire by passing large current. So you can break down that oxide, for example, and make a a permanent short circuit at that wheel, and then you can use that to store one, for example, because you can pass current. So then it's just one time program of uh, You basically locally short circuit that wheel, and then you store one there. So it's just one time programmable. So then it's uh, it's P wrong, programmable wrong. You can just do one time programming. And then uh, later, uh, the EP ROM was invented. So EP ROM means you can erase uh, and program again. So you can do uh, that a few cycles. So the EP ROM is uh, erasable, a programmable ROM. So but the, here the erase mechanism. In the old days, we use the UV light to shine the light to the chip and then erase the whole whole array. So later, in the 1970s, so this double E E E P ROM was invented. Actually, this is the early version of the flash. So E E P ROM is electrically erasable P ROM. Electrically erasable means that you can use voltage or current to erase. Then this is an like early version of the flash. And then in the 1980s, then the flash memory was uh, officially introduced by Toshiba. And then we have different versions like land versus no. And then after that, we have different, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, different interface for the uh, Flash memory you can make it like a USB or those micro SD card or SSD or this EMMC. So those are different kinds of interface I/O protocols. But the technology is based on the floating gate the transistor we are going to introduce today. So this is a brief history of the storage, and today you, you can see that the semiconductor based flash is the most popular storage mechanism here. So if you compare the hard disk drive versus your solid state drive, uh, here are some differences you can notice. Right. So the startup time, this is what you can notice. When you put up your computer, then of course the SSD you can have almost uh, instant on operation, but the hard drive you need to wait quite, let's say, half minutes, two minutes, right? So the uh, SSD is much faster in terms of the access, access time and uh, uh, latency much shorter. Mm -hmm. So the drawback for the SSD is here. The endurance or the lifetime actually is worse although the speed is faster. So the endurance of lifetime means how many cycles you can write your data into the SSD. Actually, it's limited, because each flash cell has a limited endurance. You can only write it maybe a few thousand cycles, and that's it. But for the hard drive, you can write it uh, many, many cycles. So we will talk about this endurance uh, basically, one of the reliability issues later in more details uh, for the flash technology. So, so this not this, there has been no rights to the flash, but it just put it there for like several years. Does that also impact the electric property of it? Yeah, that's retention. We will talk about that later. Yeah. So you have the lifetime issue here. Uh, so. There are other differences in those aspects. I will skip that. Uh, but still, the cost, you know, the hard 
drive is still cheaper than the SSD. So this is because the capacity or the density of the hard drive is still smaller than some of those SSDs. So let's look at the invention of this floating gate uh, transistor. So this was uh, uh, filed as a patent back in 1967 from the Bell Labs. And uh, here is a famous guy, Simon Z. He was regarded as the father of this floating gate uh, transistor. And uh, how many of you know this name? So if you take uh, semiconductor device physics, there is a very classical textbook uh, written by Simon Z. OK, so this is the original patent. And uh, it describes the device structure and the mechanism. Here, it shows some band diagram. And we will talk about that later in the class. So basically, the concept was the same as introduced in this patent. And uh, we will talk about this in more details. So here, I just want to show you the uh, original concept. And uh, this is, again, the history of the flash. And we talked about that before. And then uh, here, in the 1980s, the Toshiba first commercialized the flash. Although the concept of the floating gate transistor was proposed in, back in 1967 by Simon Z, but uh, the industry uh, actually adopted this technology in the 1980s. And uh, Toshiba invented the land structure. And then that's the beginning of this uh, flash scale. This is the actually already should be like more than 30 years flash memory scanning. And uh, you can see here, back in 1986, the feature size is like 1.5 micron. And uh, at 2011, it's already scaled down to like 2x nanometer, 20 something nanometer. And uh, after that, the industry still continues scaling down to like one x, one y, one z nanometer. They don't disclose what is the number there, but I can guess next like 13, 14 nanometer. And after that, industry switch to the 3D, which we will talk about at the very end of this lecture. So this is the history of this flash scaling. And again, with the uh, scaling, of course, the cost becomes cheaper. So here it shows the relative cost over the generations. And uh, yeah, so this, I think the Morse noise it works well here. So if you compare the price for the land flash versus the hard drive and the DRAM, Roughly, it's like 10x difference there. Let's say the dollar per bit. Right? So this is the unit price per bit. Or oh, here it shows dollar per gigabyte. So if you normalize the cost over the capacity, then here the land is cheaper than D1. And the hard drive is even cheaper than the land. This is simply because of this trade-off in terms of this capacity or density versus the excess latency or the speed. OK, so here we are going to introduce the land versus no. And I think this is an important slide. Uh, we will talk about the details later of how the land or the no array architecture look like. But here, we just want to highlight the differences in terms of the performance between the LAN and the NO. So here, 
let's look at this one by one. Cell size in terms of f square, no flash is about like 10 f square. Due to the layout, we will see that layout later. And the land flash, this is a, let's say 2D land and a single level cell. This is 4 f square. And we will see the layout later as well. So the land is uh, higher density. And uh, for the MLC, multi-level cell, both land and no can do multi-level cell. Uh, but typically land can do even higher, like 3 bit per cell. Or even these days, as in industry, introduced 4 bit per cell as well. And uh, uh, they are very similar. It's like a floating gate transistor. So this part is the same. It's a floating gate transistor. The difference is in the layer, uh, in the array architecture. The device itself is very similar. And uh, here, the key difference here is the random access. That means here, for example, the read operation. The low flash can do the random access, but the land cannot. So that means for the law, you can give a word, let's say, give a row address, column address, and then you can go to that location, and then you do read or write of that cell. It's similar like S run or D run. It's run, random access. But the land is not. Okay. We will talk about later the land operation. You cannot directly read only one cell or write one cell. So if you write, of course, write means write one or write zero. And in the flash, we will call write one as the erase. So the erase operation for the land is block like block based. That means you have to erase the whole array. You cannot erase individual cells. So it's not random access. So this is a key difference. And then both of them are long tail memory. And the operation mechanism is different. I mean the device physics to program or erase the data from the law or from the land is different. For the low flash, the mechanism is uh, this channel hot electron, and we will talk about that in more details later. But for the land flash, is the F internally. So this is a difference in the device physics, and we will talk about that details later. <coughs> and uh, yeah, this erase, as, as I just said, the land flash, you need to do this block erase. But the right bandwidth, uh, land flash is uh, a bit higher because you do the block erase, you erase the whole block. Then the bandwidth is actually a little bit higher. And then the read latency, this one is fast, no is fast, land is slow. This is another key difference uh, between the low and the land. So when you read the data out from the low flash, it can be as fast as 50 nanoseconds. But the land is pretty slow. It's like more than 10 microseconds. And we will talk about the reasons later. So I think the key difference is this rate latency. And for the rest, like the right energy, power, endurance are kind of similar. And I would say the endurance of law is a little bit better than the uh, land. But overall, they are very similar. Endurance, again, how many cycles you can write the data. So any questions on the differences? This is uh, at the high level. And later, we will talk about the details of each metric here and why that is different. So due to the 
differences in the performance, the table we showed earlier, and the applications for the low and the land are different. So for the so here the if we classify the applications into the data storage or the code storage. So data storage means massive data storage. You save a lot of data, like your image, your file, your video, your music. So then you prefer LAN because LAN has larger capacity, higher density, larger capacity. And uh, for the code storage, so for example, your instruction and to, for example, boot up your system, then this is the code storage. And uh, typically, people would prefer LOR for code storage because you need fast access. You want to access your code fast. For example, when you boot up your system. So, but nowadays, I think the land is uh, replacing law in many applications. Even for some code uh, storage, land is taking the space into the code storage. Sorry, Professor, when you say printed DVD, PDA, you're just talking about um, the embedded storage in appliances. Not specifically, you're just talking about the programmable. Um, yeah. Oh, okay, for kernel. So, so, so some code, some instructions. Okay. So, here is uh, the difference between law and land. So, basically, law has a small capacity. For example, typically hundreds of kilobits up to like uh, one or two gigabit, and uh, this is the law. And then above the two gigabit, then we have the land. So the law capacity is typically very small, like hundreds of kilobit to gigabit. Because you don't need to store too many codes there. So if you look at the market, uh, the land flash dominates the market because it is uh, much cheaper than the law and higher density. So if you look at the market for the flash, 99% of the market is land. Maybe only 1% is law. So when we talk about flash, if we don't specify, then by default we mean land flash. And uh, if you look at the land flash annual growth, it's like uh, 63%. So it grows very rapidly in the past uh, decade due to the <coughs> applications like SSD, smartphone, tablet, and so on. So those are the key drivers for the land flash growth from the consumer product point of view. And nowadays, data center also is a key driver for the land flash because data center wants to replace the hard drive with SSD. So there's a huge demand for the SSD. And if you look at the uh, uh, market, let's say applications of the land flash back in 2011, so still there are many different kinds of uh, uh, applications. SSD only take like 14%. There are still not a lot of cards. But then 2017, SSD take almost like 50%. And then smartphones. And then, you know, the USB card, SD card, the market, relative market percentage shrink. Again, what's the relation between SSD and flash? 
Flash is a technology, device technology, right? So SSD is, uh, let's say, a product. A different, of course, as I said, SSD, USB, or the SD card, the difference is, the, let's say, the interface, your I.O. protocol may be different. Right? You can have different kind of memory technologies. No, the same technology, Flash. Flash is a technology, but when you make the product, uh, when you make a chip, then you have different uh, I.O., different standard, different interface, then you have different products. But if you look at the array, memory array, it's flash. In flash, how does scaling affect latency? Does it help or does it hurt? Scaling? Yeah. Uh, we will talk about scaling, but uh, uh, I would say the scaling does not improve the speed too much. Yeah. So scaling helps with the density, but not too much on the speed. Yeah. 